Good day, everyone. Today, I'm talking to Joy Abdullah, who's the co-founder of 3-Minute Marketing. Joy has started his entrepreneurial venture quite recently, after almost 32 years of uh, experience in the corporate world. Good day, Joy. How are you today? Hi, Tony. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for this uh, privilege of coming on your podcast. Just uh, excited to share some thoughts uh, about my journey. Good on you, Joy. And, and thank you for giving us your time. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're a very busy man, a lot of responsibilities. And despite that, thank you for agreeing to be part of the show. It's a pleasure. I am busy, but I'll tell you what I'm busy about, which is creating <laughs> new clients. Uh, it's a real time consuming work for those who are in marketing would know. Lead generation takes up a lot of work. So, yeah, that's the busy part of the work. Um, but thank you. It's a delight always to come on a podcast. Good on you, Joy. And um, Joy, are you happy for me to go on to the first question? Absolutely. Shoot. Thank you. Can you please share a little about yourself, Joy, the place you were born, um, your education, your passion, the things that you enjoy doing, and one thing that the public might not know about you? Oh, okay. Um, first, for anybody who might miss the entire bit, just go on to my LinkedIn profile. Um, the profile story is there, and in my featured section, you'll find a little file called Valuable Diversity. And that's, that's Joy. Joy is diversity personified. Why? Well, within my immediate family, we have three nationalities. I'm a mini UN, by the way. I'm a British national. I was born in UK in a small little uh, town borough called Cholton of Manchester. We lived there my first 13 years of my life. I'm a third generation Brit. My parents, uh, my grandparents migrated. So my parents were the first generation, so to speak. And um, after the first 13 years, my father, who was in tea, and used to manage tea gardens in India and Sri Lanka, uh, took a posting in India. And as it so happens, like duck takes to water, uh, once my father went and the family went, well, the patriarch decided he likes India more than going back to UK. So the next uh, nearly a quarter of a century, about 24, 25 years, uh, was across India. I did my uh, late schooling, my high school in India, my uh, university and my business school also in India, and I started my career in 1986 uh, in India. So, which brings me to my education. You know, funnily enough, uh, and this I probably, I've drilled it down to a fact that it's an ethnic Indian kind of a trade. We don't, our, our, in, back in the day, our careers and our lives would sort of get laid out by our parents, who you marry, who you see. And so my father, who was a chartered accountant, wanted me to be an accountant. And so my education, my first degree went, my bachelor's was a Bachelor of Commerce, true to faith. And I was supposed to do the equivalent of the CPA or ACCA, so to speak. Uh, and I rebelled. I, I then went into doing an MBA. But in order to keep peace with my dad, I did an MBA in finance, majoring in finance and out of uh, Calcutta University. And I followed it up with another executive education with the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta uh, the year after, specializing in, in marketing. And uh, in those days, MBA was a big, big fad. And I'm talking about way back in uh, mid, mid 80s uh, to do. So that's my education. Once I finished, uh, I was amongst the first few guys who was recruited by a global agency, ad agency called J. Walter Thompson. That's how it's known today. Back in the day in India, they were known as uh, HTA, Hindustan Thompson Associates. And uh, in June 1986, I was a Greenhorn B-School grad with lots of dreams and the world to conquer, to retire at the age of 42, a career plan, island in, you know, buy an island in Cayman Islands and all those kind of dreams. And I started work in advertising and I still have to give credit to my head of marketing in my B-School who actually sent me for that campus interview because uh, that gentleman saw something that I had not been aware of within me. And he said, I'm ideal to go into marketing. And the second gentleman who believed in me was the general manager of the, of the organization that hired me and gave me my first break. And in June 1986, I started my career in advertising. And I didn't look back till 2007, literally. That was the period about 20 years, 18 odd years in pure advertising, and I worked in strategic planning, in plan management. Uh, 
creative development, the whole business unit director, understanding how uh, clients' businesses work, creating profits for the agencies I work for, grew into very senior roles in India. And then in 2000, I had an opportunity to relocate to Malaysia. And uh, it was, well, fate because I had some personal decisions and I wanted to change in my career path. And it brought me to Malaysia. And here I am settled 20 years. And just to tie back, I started with why I'm diverse. So I come from an Indian origin and I have two elder children from a uh, first marriage who are Indian. And I have two younger children and my wife who are Malaysian. So uh, I'm married twice. And that's why joy is diversity. To me, uh, the diversity of thinking is extremely, extremely important. And um, that's one of my core values. That's who I am. Now, one thing that definitely a lot of people don't know, though I'm a LinkedIn addict and I've shared a lot, and there is a file on my featured section called, this is who I am. Uh, I am an acute thriller movie buff. And within the thriller genre, I just feed off uh, forensic work. So if I were to put it under thing, one of my best TV series was the CSI, right? I just, I just have this um, addiction to scientific analysis and forensic or homicide area. Uh, could be a little morbid. I don't know if there's a hidden psychological thing in there, but that's one thing people don't know. I relax, I de-stress by watching all types of thrillers and you know science fiction, but on the forensic side, the detective forensic side area. That's my. That's the one thing that is my go-to when I'm like overwhelmed. I'm very. I want to purge my brain. I just lock into that. So that's who I am. That's joy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joy. You you touched on so many interesting uh, aspects of your life. You know, your your time in um, India, um, UK, and uh, in Malaysia. But one thing I think uh, that stood out for me was like, you know, the managers who you worked for, the people who, or I think it was in the business school you mentioned, the people who uh, believed that you had certain skills, you know, uh, one of them was marketing. And, and it's so important, isn't it, to have these people in our lives, you know, people who believe us and trust us and who motivate us uh, in the direction we ought to consider. Uh, and it's really good to hear that from, uh, from you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, if I can add a line to that. See, today, uh, in the business world and in this area of leadership, we have these words called trust and authenticity and genuinity, all of these being thrown about. And then when you bring that into a marketing realm under social media, you have this big area called personal branding. So yeah, I mean, you know, as a marketing professional, you go to my uh, bookings and you'll find a little slot there saying personal branding. I've got is the least bit of my one-on-ones that I do. I mean, and I say one-on-ones because I'm not a coach. I don't coach. I actually work one-on-one with company employees to develop their personal brand. And that fits into a bigger program that I do, which is part of my marketing inside out. I develop employee influences. All right. So in in that process, it's very important to have people in the leadership of organizations that really believe in you. Let me give you an analogy. Not every one of us, even today, sometimes I have this doubt and I'm sharing it live. I have this doubt that am I really cut out to do business? Because after 32 years of doing something, you know your skill sets and you know the pitfalls of that journey, which means I'm a very good professional manager. You know, you tell me to lead a company to profitability, no worries, right? But when you flip that and say, lead your own company to profitability, it's like a doctor trying to diagnose and prescribe medication for himself or herself, if that analogy holds good. So if you go to the medical faith, no doctor from any discipline will actually diagnose self. They'll actually go out to another fellow professional to get diagnosed on the ailment. So the same thing operates over here. Not everyone is cut out with the skill sets that they bring from employment to work in business. And 
which is why, you know, in the consulting world, you have great consultants and you have, I call them zero consultants, right? And in the great consultants, there are two levels also. Uh, there's, you know, the very good and the passe, people who just eke out a living. Where am I going with this? It all comes back to that point when you start your career. And it comes back to the leader that you have. Not to mention that I've not had bosses who've been ogres, leaders who've been absolutely demonic. And like many others and many things that you would have read, Tony, it's the lousy bosses and the lousy leaders that actually trigger what you should avoid when you become a manager. Now, in my experience, seven out of 10 times, bad managers create bad followers and bad followers become bad managers and the cycle perpetuates. But those three times when a bad follower becomes a manager, his intrinsic self-value and self-image comes up to the fore to say, I've learned this. This is not the way to deal with my team. And the change comes in, you know. So the word change maker comes from that. Back to your point. Yes, I've been blessed. I've had, I've in my three decades of career, uh, having worked, the beauty is having worked in various countries and various cities and nine industry verticals, I've had the luxury, if I may call it that, and the privilege of having different genres of leaders from the autocratic leader to the you know extremely narcissistic leader to the one who is scared of their own shadow and to the ultimate extreme where the leader is so hands off till you know the house is on fire you I've, I've experienced all of it so what i've done is i've actually distilled all of that down and created joy so when joy as a professional goes out there he goes out there with his personal value which is interact with me and you'll feel good. You'll feel joy. There's, I try and avoid a gray. There is no 50 shades of gray out here in any form. It's black and white. You'll either like joy or you won't like joy. All right. Thank and that likability factor is very important. Today, as an entrepreneur, that likability factor is very important to me because that's what creates my choice of the client. I'm not putting the choice of the client to select me. I'm retaining the power of selecting the client. So yes, I have 10 leads coming in, but I might probably just get one person connecting. And remember just before we started the podcast, we were talking about future forward. I like to look at my clients and my interactions with people who are thinking tomorrow, not today. Because when I know about somebody's thinking tomorrow, I know it's a growth mindset to use jargon. It's a you know, to get collaborative mindset. And that's what matters to me. Thank you. Thank you, Joy, for uh, sharing all those uh, wonderful points. And now moving on to our next question. Can you please share about your work experience prior to starting your venture, Three Minute Marketing? Absolutely. So I've worked across uh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, to be very precise. And I've worked out of this region, which is the ASEAN Southeast Asia region being based in Malaysia. And I've worked across nine industry verticals. The key learnings that I've had from there are, I would say three or four, and I'll put them in broad heads. Leadership, it's critical, okay, on how you lead a team. Technology, being up to date on how the technology and how you can use technology is point number two. And point number three is self-help. You've got to keep upskilling yourself and learning by yourself in order to help other people utilize or do. Taken these three, when you take them together, it creates a fourth benefit or output for me, which is called influence, which is where if you just hop into my LinkedIn profile, the second statement on my profile would say, marketing is all about engaging by influencing perception. And that's those two words, influencing perception is literally my work experience that I've been bringing over into my entrepreneurial venture. What I try to do in my entrepreneurial venture is to influence you and your view using few stuff that we'll be discussing later, like data and collaboration and stories into your business, your marketing and creating an edge, so to speak. Excellent, excellent joy. And I think that's, a, that's what a lot of businesses are looking for creating an edge. And, and thank you for sharing that. So moving on to our next question, what lessons have you brought forth from your previous work experiences uh, into three minute marketing? 
Well, it is only one lesson that I brought forth. And the reason uh, and the genesis of three minute marketing is that there's a lot of information about marketing out there, out on the internet and wherever in schools and everything. But what's not there is uh, for businesses to actually jump on and do it themselves. So three minute marketing first started as a, a vlog, a video blog with tips and the tips that we put out are meant for companies to take and do themselves. And it then morphed or it followed on from there to provide strategic marketing expertise, which is how do you make marketing be your business differentiator? That's what I've carried forward over there. It's, it's all with the intention of serving businesses from a humanistic perspective, which means it's all about caring business, caring for your community. How do you care for your people so that they can care for the community? And that's three minute marketing or the offer of three minute marketing. Thank you, Joy, for sharing uh, those uh, wonderful points. And Joy, moving on to our next question. Um, can you please tell me when did you start three minute marketing and what was the inspiration uh, behind this entrepreneurial venture? Yeah, absolutely, Tony. We started in October uh, 2019. And the inspiration behind it is to actually, one of the things missing, let me just bring this, paraphrase this. I realized that one of the things missing in the market, in the marketing world is a lot of people are offering a lot of services, but what doesn't get translated is how can those services be done by the companies and the people in those companies themselves? And that's the inspiration behind uh, Three Minute Marketing from Nick and I. It's if you look at our website, you'll find that what you have is a series of tips. And what we do is every week we bring out a tip, a weekly tip, right? And it's meant to provide a strategic viewpoint that helps a company input into their overall marketing, right? It's a strategic tip. There are tips in there which are tactical or what I mean by tactical because I'm using jargon is it's actually an action tip. You can, for example, how do you use email marketing effectively? You know, what kind of content planning should you do? So that's the inspiration. The inspiration is basically to help give our knowledge, share the inputs that we have for people to take and do on their own. Our philosophy being that when people take the tips and they do, and they find a certain value or they are stuck, they would drop us an email and we'd happily do it. And we've had it, which is why we've run webinars based on the inquiries we've received. And we've just gone on and done free webinars for uh, for our audience. Excellent, excellent, Joy. Thank you so much for sharing that. And and Joy, uh, moving on to our next question, could you please share about Three Minute Marketing's unique service offerings, that which is a standout for your customers? Oh well, the unique, the the most unique service offering that will stand out is personal brand and employee advocacy. I use these two because it's the common way to get into the mind, but an employee is a human being with a personal brand who may or may not know it. It's up to the business owner, the CEO, or you know the corporate team to realize the resource, the asset that they're holding. So what we do at 3 Minute is that we create employee engagement by building personal brand, and that's the unique service offering. You create an employee influencer, and there's two benefits that happens here. Over a six month period when you're building an employee's personal brand up, you are putting out content, which is then falling into the suite of services we give. You put out content which becomes very credible and very authentic because the community from outside says, hey, Tony works at Tony Yo's Private Limited and he's talking about what he does. This makes sense because you know the person and the brand is one and the same, right? Number one. Number two, Tony, the personal brand, starts getting visibility. And when you get visibility, you get a, a, a crowd. Your own tribe starts forming around you. And that increases the employee's marketability in terms of getting another job. Now, it's been, a, it's been really hard to tell companies to do this, but that's the unique part of it. When you invest in your person and you do it, you will, the company will always be remembered by the employee himself or herself as being the company that helped them build their own personal brand. So 10 years later, this person, when he goes out entrepreneurially, he is like, I'm giving credit back to my J. Walter Thompson general manager boss. 
you are giving a goodwill back. And this is what strategic marketing is all about. Your vision should be on a very long term, but your mission should be today and the here and now. That's the uniqueness we do at Three Minute Marketing, which is personal brand and employee advocacy. We marry it to create the marketing that really makes a difference for the business. Excellent, excellent, Joe. And I think that's very, very encouraging to hear because, you know, uh, in today's world, people are always looking for quick fixes or, you know, uh, running a sprint. But it's very encouraging to know you are positioning yourself with advice for the long term. You know, you're, you're encouraging yeah. people to run the marathon than actually, you know, a sprint. So that's that's very positive and very encouraging, Joe. Thank you for sharing that. And, and um, Joe, moving on to our next question. On Three Minute Marketing's About Joy webpage, uh, there are a few interesting words or terms that uh, you have used. So words or terms such as data, uh, collaborations, stories, differentiation, brand experience, um, emotional connect, sustainable profitability, to name a few. Uh, could you please help me understand what these words might mean to a business that may seek your advice or service, please? Thank you for asking me that. And thank you, Tony, so much for being able to pick these words out from the, from the section. These are our keywords, my keywords. And allow me a little bit of time to explain where all of this fits. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, take it from the top down. So you see, where all of this starts, all these words start, is the first word is experience, right? A brand, when you interact with a brand through its communication, through its content, at the retail outlet, at, you know, across the boardroom table, you, as a human being, you're having an experience, that moment. So you and I are talking. Let me take this analogy. You and I are talking. You're doing a podcast interview of me. I'm having an experience as are you. And our experiences are actually coming through the inputs that each one of us are communicating to each other. Now. This is where it all starts. To frame, there is a process that I use called DDG, deepen, uh, define, deepen, and grow that brand experience. So the starting point starts with, first, be very clear, what do you want that experience to be and for whom? So when you define that experience and you take the whom, the whom is the experience can't be different for customers and employees, your bank manager, business associate, or your vendors, Anybody. So the entire community, the stakeholders that the brand works with has an experience. Ideally, the experience should be the same. Remember, I talked about influencing perception. So you've got to come from thinking, what influence do I want to create the perception to be? So once you articulate that very clearly, you then look at the who and you start writing down what you want them to feel. That's the experience. And when you've written down what you want them to feel, you come to how do I make them feel it? And in the how, you need data. Without data, you won't know who is on which media and where and why. Because everybody uses social media differently. Everybody uses more than three social media accounts, right? And there's a priority of it. And everybody's looking for something in those medias. Okay, so data to understand the consumer behavior is very important, especially the value part, the value, consumer's own value system. Second is, you got to understand what will be the difference. How can you communicate you are different, but in a manner that resonates with the stakeholder, the consumer, the employee that you're talking about? So you just don't stand up and say, I'm zagging when everybody else is zigging just for the sake of saying I'm zagging. It's got to be something that resonates with your target audience, right? That's the differentiation bit. It takes a bit of time to find out. And then you depict the differentiation through what we traditionally call the logos, the brand image, you know, the, the framework, the identity, the physical identity, okay? And then you come into an area which falls into content marketing, which is, okay, so I've defined my experience. I've got the data. I've understood where I want to influence the perception. Now. What is going to make that perception resonate? Which means what is the content that will create the emotional connection? And this is where one of the data points would be what's important from a value perspective to the audience. you got to find out because the content then starts creating that emotional connect. 
And why this emotional connect is very important and it doesn't happen on day one is simply because as human beings, we are driven by our feelings, by our emotions. We may say we are logical thinking and we are driven by our logic. Logic is number two. We feel first. We do after we feel. So it's a behavior driven. That's where getting that emotional connect is very important. And when you line these ducks up, it's literally like mother duck taking their ducks to the pond. You line these ducks up and you put it out into the market in your content, in your behavior, in your employee advocacy, in your CEO online presence out there. After a certain point in time, depending on the industry, it'll vary from three months, four months to about seven months of days, consistently putting out this content, you would actually find three things happening. First, the engagement graph would be going up. And then second, from the engagement graph, you'll find the lead graph going up, people inquiring more about what, what they can do with you. And third, your sales has to walk in and start building relationships with those leads to create the sales. When you put these, these ducks in a line and you watch these three graphs grow up, you're about probably around month, month nine, month 10 in the project into the exercise. You've got two more months in your financial year. You start seeing the results coming in. But clients that we worked with are actually going to be seeing the bigger uptick when it comes into the next financial year. And that's where sustainability comes in. So what happens by doing, using data, you understand what's the values, using good emotional connectivity and content, you create the resonancy. The employee advocacy helps create authenticity. The personal brand of the CEO adds to that same authenticity and the value, and it brings that sustainable profitability. All of this gets summed up under two words, humanizing business. It's big, all about you as a human being, caring for the other human being, i.e. the community, and representing that through your personal brand and your brand mouthpiece. Boom, that's it. Those are what the entire set of keywords mean. Excellent, excellent, Joy, and that's uh, that's that's very uh, very encouraging to hear. And I think if a business comes in contact with you for advice, you know, uh, it's so good to know that you actually thought about everything in terms of the stakeholders, you know, your clients, your staff, uh, the business as a whole, the value proposition that it brings uh, into the market, um, and and the long term strategy and vision. And and I think you know one 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 good thing I, I like about your approach, Joy, is that you are truly uh, you truly care about the market and as well as as well as the business so you know you're trying to bridge that communication gap and and help businesses to to reach customers or or their clients uh, with the right message with the right information with the right product so that you know the market looks up at those brands or businesses and says okay that's the one i want you know what i mean and and that's Absolutely. very very encouraging joy thank you so much thank you and and Joy, moving on to our next question, um, could you please share about the highs in your venture for and for you personally uh, before the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic hit? Oh, good God! Yeah, I mean the highs uh, sometimes they make me cry at the moment. So last year, uh, around August onwards, I was getting exactly what you said just now uh, because of being able to have this legacy view perspective for businesses and communities. I was getting a lot of offers to speak as a public speaker and to even go into uh, medium and large corporates and address you know, the management teams to share that perspective as, as a viewpoint for them to take on board in their business planning. And that was a high. That was a high because it was getting me started on thinking, should I really, you know, I'm a very good strategic marketing consultant and I love doing what I do, but should I start considering public speaking? And I took some advice with people who are, you know, very well-established public speakers. Um, and I started that journey. And this was around December, end November, beginning December last year. I started making some sort of portfolios and topics of public speaking just to make it easy. You know, I started thinking, let me do a speaker profile. And uh, I was all ready. And that was a high, just to keep it to point. That what I've been doing since 2018. Uh, was a buildup, and the operations of it happened in 2019. 
And the high came not from the projects, but from getting these calls. And it, it was, you know, like when you've done 20, 25 uh, calls, which is what I had, and I, I managed to deliver about 22 of them, 23 of them, if I remember, uh, in person between August to mid-December. Uh, it was it was crazy. And it was all over. I was a couple of my clients that I was working with engaged me not once, not twice, but three times over. Uh, I had to fly in. Uh, they were offshore, not in Malaysia or Singapore. And uh, that was the main high. But unfortunately, that high lasted very little because come January, the bookings I had going into this period, oh my God, by, by the time it was February, it just all disappeared into, I, I could get about 20, 25% back on virtual, but not the, all of it. So those were the highs. It, it, the work, the thinking had led me to consider going into public speaking. And I'm reactivating that now to see what is the scope. Excellent. Excellent, Joy. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Joy, um, when the pandemic hit Malaysia and the world, um, what were the steps you took to mitigate its effect on uh, three-minute marketing? The best part is, and to be very precise, there was nothing to mitigate. You see, three-minute marketing works virtually. So my co-partner is based in Sydney and looks at the Australian side of the business. And I'm based in Malaysia and I'm looking at the Asia pack, which is India and the ASEAN region. And our clients were between Australia, India and Bangladesh at that point in time and even now. So a lot of our work 80% of our work, to be very honest, was already being scheduled and done virtually on Zoom before the pandemic hit. The only thing that we had to change over is there was a travel involved on the project on a quarterly basis, covering three to four days. And when the pandemic hit, we had to flip that work that we would do in person over three to four days at the client's premises onto virtual. So that was the only step that one had to take to mitigate and that was very easy because we were already twice a week we are in touch with our clients on zoom so getting into that four day period when we would be there in person we just broke the calls up to team calls and connected it up at the end of the day for a 90 minute group call where you know my bangladesh client we had oh my god we had about 28 people on the group call together different functions but it was to just get everybody on the same page and uh, on two projects, we actually introduced uh, a project management tool re readily available straight away so that all communication moved from WhatsApp into that project management tool. And that helped us. Those were the only steps we took to keep three minute marketing going. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, in a way, it's so good, isn't it? That technology is where it is today. I mean, there's still a long way to go. I would, many people would argue, but at least, you know, when the pandemic hit, there was an opportunity. An, an option for businesses yeah. to actually uh, use, you know, they didn't have to shut shop and <laughs> sit at home. You can basically run everything from your home uh, Correct. currently. Correct. Correct. There's a good and bad in that. If I may just add, a lot of businesses were caught flat footed because they'd been dragging their feet on getting into this communication parameter just at a basic level. So they were caught flat footed, but those who were already using and involved in it, the switchover was very fast. And yeah, the world has changed. I mean, the work from home debate is going to be closed out. It's We're going to see a couple of years of blended approach, but that's a separate topic altogether. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, uh, Joy. And Joy, moving forward, um, what are your plans for uh, three-minute marketing into the future? Well, right at the moment, I think we're going to be looking at how we're going to take it forward in about another three weeks' time but it's going to get focused more on, the tips would remain. We'd like to continue with the daily tips, uh, but we were going to go more into strategic marketing, which means work with clients who really wants a clear overview of what should my strategy be in terms of business and make marketing the driver of that. You know, That's where we are going with. Uh, we, Nick and I will have to sit down and do that in about three weeks time. Excellent, excellent, Joe. Thank you for sharing that. And and um, Joe, moving on to our last question. So, what are the life and business lessons that you would like to share with someone who is planning to start an entrepreneurial venture? Um, you you basically started your venture, you know, after almost 30, 32 years of corporate experience. Uh, you know, there's so much wealth of knowledge you have brought forth. Uh, you know, when you started off, 
But in general, I think there would be some uh, things that people ought to think about, you know, before they get into yes. uh, a business. So what, what, what advice would you give them? Well, from a life lessons perspective, all I would say is that don't allow your own biases to make you think that the situation that's happening to you is only peculiar to you, right? So what I mean by this is in adversity, there's opportunity, that's a cliche. But if you train your thinking to look for the light in darkness, you will find light. That's all. And I have to talk in metaphors because there's no other way I can pass that lesson. So if you know yourself, invest in understanding who you are. It's very important. And this is where it goes into an area of coaching, if I may say. But get yourself somebody that you're very comfortable with. All right. Talk bring out your emotions, understand why those emotions are happening, increase your emotional intelligence. That's that's the life lesson that I'll leave behind. The better you understand yourself, the easier it's going to be for you to empathize. And when you empathize, a bridge happens. You know where to walk across. From a business perspective and professional perspective, I absolutely agree with you, Tony. I started too late in life. I was too much in love with my corporate roles. Uh, I'm this might sound arrogant, but I'm very good at what I do. But the world doesn't know I'm very good at what I do. So how does it matter? You could be the topmost surgeon or ace fighter pilot, but you're in your own bubble, in your own network. The rest of the 7 billion people globally don't know you. So what you've got to do is you've got to break out of that and you've got to start a little early. And to use another cliche, get into doing some side hustle. Get into doing something that you could build up steadily, consciously. Don't do it like a hobby. So do it where you put down four hours, three days a week, which is 12 hours a week, you know, and start building up a network, a separate network to your, to your business and corporate life. Uh, start building up a personal identity that people recognize that you stand for. And all of these take time at the very bare minimum couple of years. I mean, I've come out of corporate in 2018 and I'm happy to dive back into corporate because that's my comfort zone. But when you're coming into doing something of your own, you've got to realize nobody knows you. Your identity is no longer president, CEO, manager. That's gone. So if you stand for Joy Abdullah, you gotta stand for something. You gotta find that. And this is where the life lesson I talked about who you are needs to come in. And then you create that identity identify what you're passionate about and see how you can monetize. And again, collaborations are very, very key. A single person doing it won't happen. So go for like-minded people, share your idea. If you find there's a connect between the goal, there's a common goal, common purpose, the how to achieve that common purpose will get you know, worked out. 50-50 investment in time, that's the skin in game. Go put your efforts into it and see if it makes money. And voila, after two years or three years, if it scales, I mean, I haven't scaled on two ventures as yet. You know, next year, probably, God willing, it'll scale. As it scales, you come to a point where you can choose to go full-fledgedly into a business that's paying you versus being in a corporate. And well, it's a lot more stress-free. That's for sure. You're taking your own stresses, your own decisions. That's the, if I may use the word, advice that I can leave with you. Excellent, excellent, Joy. And I think um, that's such a good advice because, you know, you don't need to actually jump out of your corporate space and start your venture the next day. You know, you, you know that advice is so valuable. You can have a side hustle, test the waters, see the market response. If you want to eye trade a uh, pivot, do that. And then when you see that, you know, you're getting some traction, uh, you know, probably resign from your corporate job and take the side hustle as a full-time job. And that's such a wise advice, you know, uh, it gives you that safety net too, because a lot of entrepreneurs might have commitments, you know, it, it could be family, children. So sometimes it's Absolutely. hard for them to actually completely, you know, uh, get away from their uh, yeah. eight to five job. So this is such a good advice. And thank you so much, Joy, for sharing all that insight. And, uh, you know, it's so wonderful to see your passion and uh, your drive for marketing. And I'm sure like, you know, anyone who brings you on board uh, as an advisor or as a speaker, you know, I could even think you of uh, think of you writing a book maybe in the future. So 
Uh, you know, there's so many things you could probably do. So thank you so much for your time, Joy. And um, I wish you the very best into the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Tony. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure. All the best. Thank you.